My Faith Votes. Today, I'm honored to bring you a conversation with a friend of My Faith Votes, as well as a friend of mine. His name is John Payne. He was diagnosed with ALS and given less than two years to live. But that was 18 years ago, and John recently came out with a book called The Luckiest Man. So I sat down with John to talk about the book, but also to talk about his life and his perspective on having intimacy with God. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I know you'll be moved by it like I have been. And stay tuned after our conversation to watch a short video about the life of John and learn more about his book, The Luckiest Man. John, thanks so much for joining us today. You have had ALS for 18 years. Tell us about the journey that you find yourself on right now. Most people now know that it is a death sentence that takes away your muscles with the death of the motor neurons. And, and the result is paralysis with eventual suffocation. And that part of the journey has been characterized as, well, pain and suffering. But that's really not the part of the journey that, that I choose to dwell upon. Because the other part of the journey has been one of victory. It has been one of, of uh, sliding into a dependence upon God that has produced with the an intimacy with God, one that I would never trade for. And so on the one hand is, you might say, a journey of, of death. The other is a journey of life. And I promise you that the life outweighs the death. And I think, John, that's what's so remarkable about you. I was introduced to you about three years ago when there was a documentary that came out about your life called The Luckiest Man. And now you've written a book about your story called The Luckiest Man. But you have such a different perspective on life. and. I think that's what's so fascinating is the intimacy that you have with Christ. Talk a little bit more about that intimacy that you have gotten to experience. Well, it's not something that occurs overnight. Intimacy is a, a closeness, it's a wholeness, it's a, um, sometimes I call it a oneness. It, it is about, knowing and being known at the deepest level of our being and knowing that we are fully loved, knowing that we are fully accepted, not realizing that we don't have to be or do something different, but it's as we are. And that is a, a, a process that, I, that God took me on, in, and through. And it is one that is involved, um, I guess I'll call it a journey of trust, a journey of vulnerability, and a journey of awakening my heart and a journey of communication with him. It has taken all of these to produce the the fruit of of intimacy and because intimacy is a byproduct of the life that I just described. It, we want to try to arrive at, at that fruit real quickly. And as a fruit tree doesn't produce fruit overnight, uh, neither do we have instant intimacy with God. 
it is a journey that he takes right. takes us on. And your book, The Luckiest Man, you take us through that journey and you intimately share the hard parts and the good parts. So from a practical sense, for those who may pick up your book, what's a takeaway you want them to have from that? And maybe in practical terms, how they can start putting that into place in their own life to um, cultivate that intimacy with Christ. Well, to start with, probably the biggest takeaway on what people are like is that God desires intimacy with all of us. And my greatest desire is when somebody reads and puts down this book, they will say, I want that. I want intimacy too. Because that's the point we have to we have to get to is desire it above all else. And and as we start from that place, what the book is not a teaching book. The book is showing what what I went through and the and the journey that God took me on. And, and what what I wanted to do was talk talk about vulnerability. I wanted to demonstrate vulnerability. And, you know, uh, I wanted to live trust, not tell you what trust is supposed to look like. And, you know, how could you, how can you truly be intimate with someone that you don't truly really trust? How can you be intimate if you're living in a false self? How can you be intimate if you are withholding your emotions? Um, uh, if you're withholding your emotions within your heart and shell heart, you not only are you protecting your yourself from injury is what you think, but you're keeping God out also. So I go through that process. Better yet, God takes me through the process. It walks me step by step through. Well, it was the steps that I needed because I was dealing with um, pride, uh, self-centered is uh, some things that I did not even or was not even aware of in my life. And how can you deal with those if you're not aware of them? And of course, I guess I could have asked my wife. Uh, she could have told me about those a little more quickly. She probably did, but I may not have been paying close attention. Well, John, your book is called The Luckiest Man, and tell me what led to that particular title, especially for Christians, because Christians know that God is in control and may not believe in the word luck or the idea of luck. Oh, simple that I uh, borrowed the phrase from another, uh, probably the most famous person, with ALS is Lou Gehrig, and and he was uh, a first baseman called the Iron Man of Baseball, and in his retirement with ALS, he declared himself the luckiest man alive, and it was because he fulfilled his dreams in life through professional baseball that he got to play. And so, in a similar way, uh, I fulfilled my dream of, of experiencing God and having intimacy with Him. And it's because of that I was able to fulfill the dreams of peace and contentment and joy and love 
and all of those things, how could I not say that I was the luckiest man? So we live in a world that does everything it can to avoid pain and suffering. But I think what we forget is we need to have a biblical theology of suffering, especially as we approach issues related to our culture. Um, what do you tell people to kind of help them think through what is a proper biblical theology of suffering, especially from your perspective? Well, suffering is not fun. And, and as I sit here in this chair, I'm in pain. And I don't like it. And all I want truly is out of it. Uh, and yet, we, uh, is it, what I've learned is that there is, if you're going to live in this life, there's no avoidance of pain and suffering. And, and I wish there was a way, but there's not. And there's another thing we have to be careful with, or we mess our theology, we mess our belief set. And that is that we tend to associate uh, negative circumstances with that God is displeased, that God is punishing or that we've fallen out of favor with God when we have negative circumstances in our life. And conversely, is that if everything is going great, then we are in God's favor and He is pleased with us. And then, while on occasions that can be true, we can really mess our theology up with that kind of belief and it messes with our and it uh, distorts our relationship with God and, and because of that I uh, I uh, try to help people understand or my friends understand that that that's not and that is not true, not necessarily true. And that in this world, we will have suffering. And as a result, I live in pain and suffering, but I'm not out of favor with God. And in a similar way, um, it's not a matter of if you will have pain and suffering, it's when. And when that occurs, it doesn't mean you're out of faith with God. And so I encourage people, or I encourage others to, uh, when they find themselves there, is to run to God and ask for comfort. That's the first thing he told us he would do, is that he would comfort us if we find ourselves there. So I, I run to God for comfort when I'm in the midst of pain and suffering. And it's a constant running. It's yes. not a one-time thing. No, mm -hmm. it is a constant running. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, just talk about it because we can distort our theology and our views and and come to believe uh, of uh, false things about ourselves and about God and it can be quite dangerous and uh, I, mean, I think there's nothing more that, that messes with people's head is when they have they're in the midst of pain and suffering and they they run to God with the one question that prolongs their suffering. The one question is why? 
And that's a question that God does not answer. And it's the first question we want to ask is why. And someone else may have got an answer to that, but I've never met anybody that has. Uh, going to God and asking for comfort is something guaranteed he can and will do. I encourage you, if you have a question, it's more what. What do you want to do through me or what do you want to do in me as a result of this? Whether it's suffering that you've caused yourself, whether it's suffering caused by a broken and fallen world, or broken and fallen people that you have no part of. But, but uh, so, all of those are uh, events that occur that create uh, suffering in our lives and I've just tried to avoid that false thinking about suffering. Um, in our society today, there's becoming more of a, an issue with pro-life issues, especially along the lines of euthanasia and assisted suicide because people want to end the pain. Um, how do we approach that, especially when it reaches the ballot box for us, when we have elected leaders who are making decisions like that. Um, we know that that's the importance of having a solid foundation of knowing a biblical theology of suffering. But when we're faced with those issues more and more in our culture today, how do you speak to that in answering really tough questions to wrestle with regarding those issues? Well. Uh... I've been offered the opportunity to, uh, by my choice, to end my life. I actually talk about that in the book. Uh, and it is, can I tell you that when you are hurting most days, all day, sometimes with an intensity that overwhelms you. You are tempted to take or to think about that option and to tell you that I haven't thought about it, I would be misrepresenting the truth. And I think if you're human, you will. And quite frankly, I have never been an ALS patient that hasn't talked about that option because this is not a fun disease to endure. But at the same time, I do believe that, that God is the author of life and He is the ender of life. And it's not my choice to make. And as I've said in my book, is that, is that uh, I'm going to allow God to make that choice. And, and, but I've, I've also made my desires known to my wife and children that I'm not here to live at all costs. I would prefer death right now to the physical life that I have to live. Um, the, the spiritual life that I am able to live far exceeds the discomfort. And so um, for me to uh, live as Christ, uh, to die may be, uh, it may be nice, but God still has a purpose for me, or I would be gone. And the book would have never been written 
if I would have done what my flesh wants to do, which is check out. And hopefully the book will impact a few people's lives. Absolutely. A new soul just was was uh, welcomed into God's kingdom just a few days ago because of, well, uh, 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 sharing the gospel with uh, a friend. And, and so, uh, which makes it a great 2019 for me as, uh, uh, as uh, individuals except Christ is, and I just get to share. It is so much fun. It is so much fun. Well, I love the hope that you give through your life and your example. So I want to thank you for bringing hope despite such challenging, difficult circumstances. And I hope that those that read your book are able to see that as well. So any final thoughts for those watching this time that we've been able to chat with you? Um, one final thing you'd like to leave them? There is hope. And for all that have desired a closeness with God, intimacy with God, all their lives, there is hope. For all that have desired for God to speak with them through scripture and in their minds, there is hope. For all that have wanted to understand what Christ said in John chapter 17, that he prayed for us, that we may be one with, with God. There is hope. And I, I had given up on that hope. And shortly thereafter, that's when this occurred to me. And I can tell you that I would love to get out of this chair. I would love to hold my wife's hand. I would love to hug my grandchildren. There's so many things I would love to do. But if that meant having to go back to my old ways of experiencing God, my old relationship with God, I would not do it. I'll keep this disease to have the relationship that I do with Him. And that's what I want everyone to know. My name is John Payne and I've got what you want. 18 years ago, I lived a normal life. Then suddenly, I was diagnosed with ALS and given a few short years to live. It has paralyzed me from head to toe and will eventually suffocate me to death. When you look at me, you may not recognize it, but I'm actually the luckiest man alive, and I've got what you want. I would love to be free of this chair, to walk again, to be able to hold my wife's hand, to hug my grandchildren, but not if it means losing what I've gained. I know you may think I've lost my mind, but I haven't. In spite of all this disease has stolen from me, I have gained what every Christian deeply longs for, and it has become my most prized possession. I've got what you want, and I want you to have it too.